This is my transcription for harpsichord of the song Paranoid Android by Radiohead. If you're not familiar with the song, it is very easy to listen to it online. One personal recommendation, if you search for it on YouTube, usually the first choice is the official video. Now, I don't know how much input the band had in the creation of this video, However, I personally feel that it is not particularly successful and detracts from the song because it creates a crude story that does not really take into account the multiple meanings and open-ended narrative of the text. And it does not reflect in any way the song's sophisticated musical content. So I would recommend that you listen to the song on its own in this introduction, I would like to look at the formal and harmonic content of the piece and then tell you how I approach the transcription with the goal of creating something idiomatic for the harpsichord. Paranoid Android is the second song in Radiohead's album OK Computer. In terms of its structure, the song goes far beyond the formal confines of a standard rock song. And as a matter of fact, many commentators view it as an example of progressive rock. Members of the band have confirmed that the departure from the standard verse and refrain format was deliberate and reflected an attempt to emulate similar uses of extended formal structures by the Beatles. Since we're dealing with a non-standard form, there can certainly be different ways of navigating through the song, so the following is simply my own understanding of how the song is structured. Paranoid Android is divided into three main sections each with its own character and formal profile, with the second section returning in a shortened form after the conclusion of the third section, and thus functioning as a sort of coda. The first section resembles a standard verse and refrain format and can stand on its own as a microcosm of an entire traditional rock song. This is because it arguably contains both a verse and a refrain, both of which are stated twice after a brief introduction, and each occupying, or rather suggesting, a different tonal area. The verse starts in C minor, but seems to glide towards G minor. Let me show you a little bit what I mean by this. And while when I actually play this, the chords will be arpeggiated, now I'm simply playing the, the chords themselves so you can see what is happening here. So the introduction, by the way, has the exact same harmonic structure as the verse. So I'm playing the introduction, but this is exactly what you would hear anyway um, for the verse as well. So we start in C minor. And then... get to G minor and then first inversion chord G minor so we get there um, I'll tell you what happens there's one more chord after that um, the ambiguity this this kind of ambiguity between the the two tonalities is further amplified since neither of these two tonal areas are provided with dominant chords in other words, we get neither a G dominant chord nor a D dominant chord, and the verse comes to a halt on an E half diminished chord that doesn't really belong in either of the two. So right after that chord that I played, the G minor chord, we get to that E half diminished seventh chord and that's that's really the the entire harmonic progression here um, now the refrain starts with 
a G minor chord with the added pitch E. This pitch E serves as a common tone for the three chords that make up the refrain, um, which are G minor, D minor, and E dominant seventh. Now, what is happening is that the chords themselves, um, we have, as I said, uh, G minor, D minor, and this E dominant seven. But what happens actually is that uh, what we get is uh, we're presented this as a descending bass line uh, going from G to F, which is a D minor chord in first inversion, and then an E. So what we actually hear um, is this. But all in all of these chords, we also have the pitch E always present. So the, the actual thing, and this is of course the, the pitch E, is also a pitch that is being sung by Tom York. So um, what we actually hear, if you were to, to include that pitch along with the harmonies, is something like this. And this indeed is what constitutes the refrain. Um, now, while this E dominant chord creates an open-ended feeling the first time around, since the second verse again commences in C minor, it helps introduce the, the very different tonal world of the second section, which mostly centers in A minor and its relative major C major. Now, before we venture into the second section, I should mention here that the vocal line of the second verse is quite different from that of the first, especially in its opening descent that contrasts with the ascent of the first verse. So what I mean by this is that if you actually look just at the vocal line, and I'm moving pages because the, the whole transcription takes up 10 pages. So, um, and I figured out a slightly creative way to turn pages while I'm performing the piece. Um, so the, the original, the, the melody in the first verse, so we have this ascent. The second time around, the second verse, does a descend. One could say it's almost a, a, an inversion. So the beginning, it's an inversion really of, of the first verse. So um, there is this, this one difference. The second section is more episodic in character and alternates between two main ideas that each have their own tonal and rhythmic identity. The first idea is in 4-4 and in A minor, while the second idea is in 7-8 and in the relative key of C major. But there are other differences between them as well. The first idea is more linear rather than harmonic and the use of different types of guitar distortion oftentimes obscures the perception of a definite pitch. The few moments where Tom York sings exclusively occur within this first idea, and similar to the instrumental content, he sings in a way that results in a hovering between pitches. Clearly, this was one of the most difficult parts of the song to transcribe, since I had to choose particular pitches in places where more than one choice was possible. The second idea, in contrast, is decidedly harmonic, with chords always easily perceptible. The third section provides a stark contrast to the frenetic activity of the previous section, 
there is a strong reference to a choral setting as a texture and chordal writing peppered with suspensions and other non-chord tones are very reminiscent of four-part harmony. The way this section is structured is also reminiscent of classical models in the way that it adds layers to its texture. Uh, think for a moment of the finale of Beethoven's Eroica Symphony, where we start with a simple bass line, then slowly add the other voices, and then finally we get the melody. Now, clearly, uh, this section unfolds within a much smaller, shorter time frame. So there isn't such a gradual layering involved, but the procedure is certainly similar, because what happens is we start with just the harmony, then we add the melody, and finally we get an ornamented version of the melody, so that the last part functions like a variation of the original theme, if you will. Let me show you what I mean. Um, first, find the correct page. Um, so what happens is, at first, we just get the, 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 the chords, the harmony, and this is without any melody whatsoever. And, and notice here that we really have this almost four-part texture, so there is a, a slight reminiscence of a, of a chorale here. Um, and we have this, this kind of nice... And so, if this is our harmony... happens is we, we, we add a melody. Now at first the melody shares the same pitches as the harmony, but then eventually you will notice that it starts moving a little above that, so that we have now this. So we have now the melody, and then what happens at the, at the end is that we retain the same harmonic progression. We now get a variation of the melody, a little filling out, an ornamentation, if you will. Um, so that what happens is, here again we have this. What happens after that is that we get an ornamented version. So now it's... And so on. So. I would say that, that there is a little reference here in the way we, we start with the basic harmony, we add the melody, and then we get an ornamented version of the melody, just like a little, a little variation. In terms of tonality, this section certainly harks back to the first section, as once again we begin in C minor, but immediately move away from it. This time around, this moving away has a more definite goal, which is the key of D minor. So what happens is, yes, we have this, this very beautiful chromatic descent. But then we end there, so... A dominant. So there 
there's a, there's a definite emphasis here in D minor, and we are preparing it uh, by twice hearing the dominant of A. So it's, it's definitely here in, in D minor. Now, one could argue that in addition to this being the more obviously classically inspired section, it is also perhaps, I would say, the most lyrical and reflective. And it's also the one I think fits a harpsichord transcription just perfectly. Uh, indeed, this is the, the very first section I transcribed and then I kind of worked backwards from it. Finally, we return briefly to the world of the second section, including the alternation between the two ideas in A minor and C major. This time, though, everything is purely instrumental, at least in the original song, everything is, is instrumental here. Um, and there is a sense that the narrative of the original second section has been compressed within a much shorter time frame, so that this compressed version really functions as a coda. In making this transcription, I decided to impose a couple of restrictions, or if you prefer, I wanted to fulfill a couple of self-imposed requirements. First, I wanted my transcription to reflect the exact proportions of the song as it was recorded for the album OK Computer. This means that I wanted to follow and include everything that is happening measure for measure without adding or subtracting anything. This was particularly challenging when it came to the second section and its reappearance as a coda, since here is where we get a lot of instrumental passages that rely on timbres and techniques that are very specific to the electric guitar and the electric bass, uh, especially when it comes to such things as using distortion, for instance, uh, where pitch is either obscured or there is the implication of a multiplicity of pitches. Nevertheless, I persisted, and what you will hear in the transcription is the song unfolding just as it does on the album. My second requirement was very similar to the first one, but in this case it involved the harmony and the vocal line. In other words, I wanted to make sure that my transcription included the exact harmonies and vocal line of the original to the extent that this was possible to achieve. The challenge here was once again in transcribing the second section, and I've already mentioned why this is so, and there were instances where I had to approximate what is actually happening in the song. As I said earlier, this transcription is specifically made for the harpsichord. This does not mean it can't be played on a piano or a synthesizer, but I would not really think that it would work that well on either of those instruments. And this is because while making the transcription, I had in mind the unique qualities and capabilities of the harpsichord. Some instances where this, I think, is fairly noticeable include the almost exclusive use of the lower registers of the instrument, which helps with drawing a richer resonance out of the instrument, especially with the way chords are arpeggiated. Moreover, since there is no sustaining pedal, the vocal melody is oftentimes part of the chordal figuration, sometimes appearing in the middle or even the lower node within a chord, rather than always being the highest note, hovering above an accompaniment. The two hands also tend to play fairly close to each other as a means of holding notes beyond their written value and thus creating an effect of over legato and sustained sound, as well as aiding with the creation of subtle dynamic changes. Now, in terms of these subtle dynamic changes and contrasts, one easy way to create them would be to do something like switch manuals, or couple the manuals, or even add the forefoot stop in certain passages, so that you can have different combinations of strings being plucked at the same time. 
indeed I can imagine that in this transcription there are places where changes of registration are fairly easy to do and would achieve a nice contrast. However, since I'm always interested in exploring the possibilities of these subtle dynamic changes and contrasts inherent in how the strings are plucked and especially inherent in the resonance of the instrument, I decided to forego the easy solution and with one momentary exception where a musical line is stated first by the voice and then imitated verbatim by instruments. So there I wanted to employ two different timbres as a means of differentiation. Other than that, I have decided to use exclusively only the lower manual, plucking its one set of strings. The idea is to achieve the maximum variety possible with the simplest means. As always, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the performance.